my wife and I are very glad to be here. We're glad to get an opportunity, any chance, at any church, anywhere, to stand up and present the ministry and what God's called us to do. He's called us to the United States military to pastor and minister and to love those military folks that go overseas, go to Germany, uh, Korea, Japan, Okinawa, um, all over Europe, Spain, and um, Italy, down into Puerto Rico, down there across from South America, and then, of course, even stateside. There's places where military folks, believe it or not, are almost forgotten, and we're so focused on sending those missionaries, and we ought to be over to South America, or over to South Africa, or over to the islands in Fiji, or the Philippines, or Taiwan, or these underground places in China, North Korea. But we tend to forget there's an entire people group, a population that looks just like you and me, uh, looks like us, and uh, grew up with us and our family members, and they're just a small micro uh, version of a community around you, the military is. There's some 350,000 United States military folks stationed overseas right now. Um, add about, about a third of those folks or less might have their family members with them. So you might have 500 to 550,000 folks at any given time overseas needing good Bible preaching, amen, Bible preaching, uh, fundamental, independent Baptist churches outside those installations to get away from the military chaplaincy corps, to get away from the, the, the restrictions and the regulations the military puts on preaching the gospel, to get into somewhere that will tell them that Jesus Christ can change their lives. He changed my life. I hope he changed yours. I want to tell you a little bit about the ministry that God called us to. This is my wife, Devonna. She, she doesn't appreciate it or like it, I think, when I ask her to stand, so I'm not going to the night. Uh, we'll just mention the fact that she doesn't like it. How's that? And uh, I'm glad that she's with me today. Uh, our children have just enrolled in college and they've been back finishing up a senior year in high school and preparing to do some things this summer. And I've had to travel to about 52 churches and she's been with me in about um, probably over half of those, but not every one. Um, um, any mothers in here or, or parents of teenagers, there's a lot going on back home and uh, we can't drag them around with us everywhere. So it's always a blessing when she's here. <clears throat> now, last time I was here was uh, about a year ago. Uh, me and your pastor were trying to figure out when it was. I know it was before September, because we, or maybe even before August. We didn't have clear, concise guidance from God where we would go at the time. We just knew that God had called us back to the United States military. At that time, I probably had about six months left in the military to complete a 20-year career. Praise the Lord, God in that time allowed us to complete that 20-year career. Now I have retirement, some disability, some things helping us out uh, on our way to the mission field, which by way of uh, introduction there is an amazing help to the support we need to raise. Uh, the, the retirement is an amazing chunk. Uncle Sam doesn't know this. But every month when he writes that proverbial check to Brandon Neal, Sergeant First Class Retired, that check comes into my account and he's supporting worldwide missions as a large portion of that goes over to my support fund. Praise the Lord. Not all's bad in our government today. Don't let them tell you it is. So during that time, we came here. I think I spoke to your pastor maybe the week before, and I just can't remember. I might not have even spoken to your pastor. Or maybe we just dropped in because we were awful close. And uh, let him know what we're doing and where we're trying to go. Well, during that time, after I, gave, I had a few minutes to tell you that the Lord had called us to the military work, we would be uh, retiring soon. During that time, a great military missionary named Tom Lancaster. Uh, if anybody's been in the military or been over in Germany overseas, but then around the world with Baptist International Missions, Tom Lancaster was a military missionary in Germany with a great church at Rhine River Baptist Church for about 25 years. He saw hundreds, hundreds of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines come through there and get saved and get called to the ministry and now serving faithfully in the ministry. And one of those men was Larry Ferguson about 25 years ago, 22 or 3 years ago. Larry Ferguson then got out of the military and God called him to be a missionary to the United States military. I'm so thankful that he surrendered. Amen. 
He surrendered to the military, to, to the mission, mission field. He raised his support in a quick fashion, and he got straight over to Korea. And he started a church 19 years ago in the northern part of South Korea. But it only lasted about three years. The military, 16 years ago, began transitioning a little bit further south in South Korea, doing some strategic planning for times as such that we're in now. And so he moved the church. God helped him there move. And most of the people that were locals in his church that weren't military, that were able to move, moved down there with him. Uh, they just packed up, moved, got jobs down there. And so he has a mix of locals, Koreans, um, Filipinos, some Kenyans, um, um, some uh, other African folks there, uh, Nigerians, and then a handful, about 30 or 40 soldiers, sailors, or airmen, marines at any time. And he moved down that point 16 years ago to Daegu, South Korea. You can Google this if you're on the computer often or tomorrow or tonight. You can Google Calvary Baptist Church in Daegu, South Korea, and that's where he's been for 16 years, and he's had a wonderful ministry. He's had, he doesn't know, um, he, he and his wife disagree on the number. Uh, one says 19 and another says 20. But 19 or 20 young men have surrendered their life to full-time ministry, either gospel preaching, pastoring, or on the mission field, 19 or 20 people in the 16 years that he's been in Daegu that have come through and surrendered their life, uh, 14 or 15 of them to military missions or military churches and preaching and pastoring and loving the military folks and then a few extra in other areas. Um, a highly fruitful, fruitful ministry, and now it's time that he comes home and is going to be uh, busy in Panama City, Florida in a great church. But the church he's leaving has no Timothy there to hand it over to. You know the biblical model of Acts, uh, Acts in our Bible, uh, this, this great missionary, of maybe a Paul type man would go out and find a place and God would, God would lay on his heart this place, maybe the, 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 the Philippine Islands or maybe down in Fiji or maybe let's say South America. And he gets down to South America and this young Paul, or in my case, an old, an old Paul, would, uh, would uh, go from village to village and uh, maybe get up into the mountains or into the jungles or take a boat down the river and we're searching constantly, trying to find somewhere that God would, 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 would have us to serve here in South America, right? And so once God solidifies that, stay with me, I'll just, by way of introduction, tell you the difference between military missions and missions. I don't want to uh, add to or take away from our biblical model, but there's clearly a difference. And let me tell you why. So let's say, what's your name again, brother? Tim. Tim. Brother Tim has surrendered to the mi mission field and he's going to South Africa. And while Brother Tim gets over to South Africa, um, you don't know where in South Africa. You're pretty close. You're in the capital city and there's two independent Baptist churches in the capital city and you're looking for somewhere where there's not an independent Baptist uh, a church there in their language with a King James Bible in their language and the scriptures that you can expound on and teach and reach them with the gospel. You don't know where that is, but it's in South Africa. Okay, maybe I said South America earlier. Let's go with South Africa, it's better. So you're down in South Africa and you're, you're taking a, a bus from village to village and you're looking for, God, is this where you would have me? God, would you have me in this village? God, would you have me in this village? And pretty soon, God uh, uh, introduces you to a local. And you know what? That local has a prayer group in the bottom of his house every Sunday and all week long. And they've been praying for God to send a man to South Africa. And you've just been there. God has answered their prayers. So you began praying, is this where it is, God? Is this where you would have me work with this local national and start a church? And then you, you might need to uh, uh, learn the culture and the customs of the South African folks. It, it's a different, it's not the same as it is in Austin, Texas. We keep it weird in Austin, right? <laughs> They don't do that in South Africa. It's different. The customs, the courtesies, the laws and regulations. And you might even have to learn a new language in South Africa. All that's called a, a, a survey trip. Everybody familiar with the survey trip missionaries have to take? That might take several months, I don't know, to get prepared before he comes back on deputation. I often love to tell the churches this. God has had me on a 20-year survey trip. Amen? 
Amen. 20 years I've served with them. I've fought with them. I've deployed four times with them. I've been overseas to Korea three times with them. Uh, uh, I've been led by some of the best and some of the not so best. I've led some of the best young men. Uh, I've fought with them. Uh, I've earned my uh, combat infantry badge. Uh, we've, we've unfortunately had to zip up body bags and send them home. I've escorted bodies home from overseas. Uh, I've, I've grown to love them and they're part of me. I, I know the language. I know the customs, the courtesies, the cultures. And God said, hey, I'll let you retire. Your 20 is up. I'll let you take the uniform off. But you can't get away from the military. The very same day, Brother Stuart Jellison, missionary to the military in Okinawa, was preaching a sermon out of John chapter 4 about passing up those opportunities God has given us. The very, the very same day when I couldn't, I couldn't get through his presentation without crying and bawling, my wife was feeling the very same tug on her heart. That very same day we went forward and we said, what's the next step, God? Are you calling us to the mission field? All that time, all that time, two years ago, God was working on Brother Larry Ferguson, saying, Larry, you need to find a replacement. You need to come home. Larry's very healthy, very fit, older man. You wouldn't think he's ready to come off the field, but it was just time. And it was time that he begins calling us. And that's where I'm talking about, he's been here 16 years. Why is Larry not turned it over to anyone? Here's another difference. That survey trip he had to take, I don't have to take. But now, now uh, Brother Tim is in South Africa, and you've been there four or five years. You've, you've canvassed that whole village and the surrounding villages, and people are driving buses or riding horses or walking overnight to come to your church services, and they're getting saved by the numbers, and you've got 20, 30, or 40 people in a congregation, but you hear about there's a village over that mountain over there. They want what this village has. They need a church, and they need a preacher to lead them, Brother Tim. What's Brother Tim do now? His hands are tied. He's stuck with this church. No, he hands it over to a young Timothy, doesn't he? There's a young man that God's been preparing that was saved under your ministry, most likely, that never even heard of Jesus Christ, that now wants to serve and preach and teach the gospel. And God's going to use him, so you're going to train him up and you're going to implant young Timothy there in the pulpit to take that church. And Tim now is going to go down to that next village and start a church. Is that pretty much what everybody understands missions is? Church planting, Bible preaching, soul winning, all for the glory of God. Amen? All for the glory of God, serving Him. Larry Ferguson's been here 16 years. I say here. This is my church. This is Calvary Baptist Church in Daegu, South Korea. He's been there 16 years. He can't turn it over to a young Timothy. There's 300 soldiers showing up this week in South Korea. 300 getting off an airplane from the States and landing in South Korea to replace the 300 that are leaving. It's a revolving door. And 95% of them will be there for about 12 months. And when, when Larry or when Brother Brandon and Miss Devonna are out passing out tracts, inviting folks to church, letting them know Calvary Baptist Church is right outside the gate, hang a left, walk about five minutes, it's a great church. When I'm talking to them, they didn't just get off the airplane today. They might have been there one month or two months, would be my best case. I would love to have somebody for seven, eight, nine months. But they might be on the short, short end of their tour and be there three or four months. Best case scenario, I'm able to invite them to church and they come. They hear the gospel preached. The Bible says that even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus Christ says later in John chapter 8, then he said, and I, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men toward me. If we'll just do our... I'll, preach in a minute, but if we'll just do our job to lift up the name of Jesus where we go, if we'll walk out of here with a pocket full of tracts and get people to the house of God so they can hear the gospel preached, if we'll be a faithful witness in the school system instead of fitting in with the crew, and if we'll be faithful out there at the workplace and we'll tell people about Jesus and what a difference he made in our life, if we'll just be faithful to lift up the name of Jesus, he'll draw all men toward him. So back to Korea, here I am. I'm out looking, and I'm looking for soldiers. 
In Korea, it's easy to find a soldier. In Korea, we know what Asian people generally look like without having to generalize. And I'm very, you don't look very Asian, Brother Tim. And I could see you walking down the street and I could tell right away you're not South Korean. <laughs> but you don't look like a soldier, but you're not South Korean. This young man looks like a soldier, and if he was over there, I'd probably approach him. Looks like a soldier to me. I tell churches a lot, soldiers, you can spot them. They either got short hair, nice, nice haircut like mine, or they're doing something stupid. <laughs> so I look across the street, and this young man's doing something stupid, right? <laughs> so I'm going to run over to him and say, hey, my name is Brother Brandon Nils, my wife Devonna. We're pastoring a church right down the street off base, Calvary Baptist Church. And I'll ask him this question. Do you go to church anywhere? No, sir. He has to say no. There's not another English preaching. There's not another church that he's going to in that area. So he can't lie to me. I already got him. And I'll ask him, would you like to come to church Sunday? Do you need a ride? I'll come get you. Now, that, now you get to a whole nother branch. All sorts of excuses. No, I'm too busy Sunday. No, I don't go to church. No, I, I, I go to the chapel. No, we have a Bible study. No, I don't believe or whatever. whatever. Whatever excuses you hear in Austin, Texas, you still hear from the soldiers in South Korea. Amen? And I'll say, well, how about Saturday? My wife's cooking a big plate of enchiladas. Would you like to come over and eat? Got him. <laughs> Here he comes. And he'll bring about 10 of his friends with him. And you know what? What they get when they come to the servicemen center at the church after we eat? You know what they're going to get a big dose of? They're going to get a big dose of the gospel. Amen. I'm going to tell them like Brother Tom Lancaster said. I'm going to say, let me tell you soldiers something. One day somebody gave me something much like this, the plan of salvation. And it absolutely changed my life. I tell them what God did for me when he saved me. And how while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And then if I'll yet just believe with my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord is Jesus. And who, he, who he says he is is who he is. And what he said he'll do, he'll do. And what he did victoriously, he did. Amen. And tell him about all how all the ground is level at the cross. And that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Best case scenario, that Saturday night, that young man receives the gospel and gets saved. Or maybe Sunday comes forward, baptized, and I get him plugged into the church, but I find out he's only got 90 days or 120 days. Hey, when soldiers land in Korea, they already have a countdown of coming home. That night, when they call home to their girlfriends or their wives, they say, 364 left, baby, I'll be home. 364. Next week, they say, 328 days. I'll, we've been on that countdown, Devon. Way too many times, nine years of my 20, I was spent away from my wife and family. We know those countdowns. And those soldiers can't tell me, I don't know. I know, I've been there. Been there. That's just an introduction. It's different. This ministry now, now this ministry is a discipleship. It's a soul winning discipleship. Get them in. Get the world away from them. Tell them Jesus Christ loved them. Guaranteed that salvation. Tell them why they know they're saved, why they can't lose the salvation, and why they ought to choose not as, a, as a, uh, uh, an opportunity to serve the world, but an opportunity to serve the Lord, as your monthly verse is. Amen? An opportunity to serve God. And let God do all the work. Maybe I need to be the dad to them instead of the preacher for a little while. Maybe they need dad over there. That's okay. I can be a dad. I've got three teenagers. Maybe she's mama for somebody. Maybe I've got to be somebody's first sergeant. That's okay. I can do that too. Maybe I'm just going to be Pastor Neil. But love them. Put everything I can into this young man. And then lastly, very important job. It involves the discipleship process is to find out where they're going in the States and give that fella a call and hook them up with a good church. Hey, Brother Adam Garber, Northside Baptist Church there outside Fort Hood. Could, I'm going to send a soldier your way. Here's his contact information. He'll be there next week. Don't let him fall through the cracks. Somebody will be there finding that soldier, getting him in church, plugging him in. Hey, Brother Marty Wynn down at Fort Benning, Georgia, Lighthouse Baptist Church. I got a soldier coming your way. Hey, Brother Ricky, uh, Brother Ricky Clark, that's my old pastor. Praise the Lord. Hey, Brother Dave Knopfsinger at uh, Maranatha Baptist Church there at the 101st. Hey, got a soldier coming your way. Plug them in. That's what our job is. 
My point was, way back about 10 minutes ago, <laughs> was there's no young Timothy to hand it over to. As much as whatever God, whatever God does with this young man in the three months, six months, nine months I have with him, whatever God does, he's not going to pastor this church. I can't, I can't turn it over. He's going back to the States. Those local nationals that, that are faithful to my church, the Korean people that come to learn English, or the Nigerian people, or the people from Kenya, or the, or the Filipinos, the, we have a small number of each one of those in the church uh, a body. I can't turn it over to them. They can't pastor military folks. <laughs> it's a military work, and it takes, like your pastor said, you've got to be one of them to be one of them. Amen. I'm thankful that God allowed me to do it, has called us there. Let me tell you our schedule real quick, and I'll get into the Bible. Uh, the best part of this message, I hope, will be the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> We began December 1st. I had 60 days of leave saved up. Praise the Lord. And 60 days before my retirement date, who's prior military in here? Anybody prior military? So you know about saving up some, some dates. It's hard to do because you want to take every date you can. So the whole last year, I didn't take anything. Plus, I had 30 days of leave to retire with. So I had 62 days, actually. So December 1st, I could sign out on leave and be on leave for 62 days before February 1st. And I would sign out and retire February 1st. That's when I retired, and I've been retired about seven months. So December 1st, I signed out on leave, and December 3rd, I was in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, at Brother Mike Norris's church presenting the ministry. Two days after I retired on leave, and I've been on deputation since. I hadn't retired and taken a vacation yet. We're, we're waiting on that to come in the schedule somewhere. It's, it's nowhere close, I don't think. Uh, we've been on deputation about eight and a half months. September 1st will be nine months. As I said, praise the Lord, we have uh, a retirement that's coming to going to a big portion of our support. And with that retirement and the support that we've raised, we're at about 93% this week. Praise the Lord. I, I don't foresee us being on deputation past 10 months. I've got a meeting at Lancaster Baptist Church uh, in their missions conference October 27th, 8th, and 9th, and 30th. October 30th, when I leave California and drive back this direction, I don't foresee us in any more meetings. I hope that we've raised our support by then. What we haven't raised will be uh, um, uh, added to the uh, retirement fund, and what we have raised over will be just a blessing we'll need because we'll lose churches over the years. But October 30th, we come back and we have November, December, and January. We have three months at that time. Uh, at that time, those three months, we'll tie up some loose ends. We'll take care of our visas, our passports, our ministry degrees that get, get, get us over into uh, South Korea. We'll pack our container, our shipping container. We'll get it all prepared. Uh, we have a grandbaby coming, our first grandchild coming on the 1st of February or thereabouts. We'll wait once that baby is born and we soak up some good love there for a week or two. We plan on getting out by mid-February to South Korea. During that time, Brother Larry Ferguson is probably standing at the gate of the airport waiting on us to show up. He's waiting to hand that work over to us. We're thankful for that. He'll spend a couple of weeks, maybe even a month with us to hand over financial things, make sure we're set, we're in the saddle and we're in the stirrups and we're ready to go. Then he'll head on back and he's got an important ministry to get back to. So we'd ask if you take one of our cards at the end of the day, uh, ask me a question at the end of the day, uh, anything you would like, no questions off limits uh, almost. And I'll answer anything you'd like because honestly, I could teach a Sunday school lesson on military missions and the difference of military missions and just missions. Just the, the intricate differences are enormous, innumerable. Uh, there's no charter members of that church, no charter members, nobody. Anybody that votes me in this month because I'm going to be the pastor in six months, anybody that votes me in this month probably ain't going to be there when I show up. There's no charter members. There's no deacons, trustees. There's no, there's no uh, continuity is out of control. A discipleship program can't last more than about eight weeks, six weeks or eight weeks because now you've got a whole new crew. You've got to start over. Uh, I only need about four weeks of sermons. So I can just start going through them for the next 16 years. That's not true, really. Nobody would know but my wife my biggest uh, supporter. So it's crazy different ministry, crazy different folks. And I'd love to tell you all about it, but I would just be 
I would just be shortchanging God in a message that I've been able to share a couple of times, and I really want to share some thoughts with you. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Where's that song leader at today? Who was that? We were singing victory in Jesus, and I yelled out, sold! Did everybody get that? I don't think you got it, because after the first verse, the, the song leader said, hey, I want to point this out. This gentleman that's, that's visiting us is talking about how he heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, and he sought me. I mean, he's, he's out looking for your old sorry soul, and then he bought you with his redeeming blood. He paid the price of Calvary. What you were worth was the blood of Jesus Christ. He bought you off the sin block of slavery. He bought you, and at that point, I like to yell out, Sold! I'm sold out to Jesus. And it excites me because there was a time, if you remember, it may be you, I don't know, maybe it's just me, when we were sold out to the world. Paul said, I was least of the apostles. Paul said, I'm not meet to be called an apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. I'm not even meet to be called the apostle. He said, because I once persecuted the church of God. And then Paul says this, praise the Lord, here's soul business comes in. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. But by the grace of God, you've got a lovely wife sitting next to you today, folks. But by the grace of God, you've got four healthy boys in your family, sir. But by the grace of God, you even have a bit of concern to come to the house of God today. But by the grace of God, you'd be under the bridge with some of these folks that we drove past today on the way to church without a care in the world about the things of God, but by the grace of God. And Paul knew who he was. Paul, I believe when Paul wrote every, Paul wrote over half of the New Testament, I believe, and as he's writing, I believe he had to stare at the pen and paper he was writing on through tears in his eyes because he knew he wasn't even deserving to be writing the words of God on a piece of paper. And there God was filling him with those words. And he penned those words, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And he said, and that grace that was bestowed upon me, hey, church, he says, it won't be in vain. Don't let the grace that God's given you be in vain tonight. Hey, young people, your parents get you up and bring you to church and raised you in the nursery and taught you the Bibles from the very beginning. And, or maybe you came on a bus or maybe you, I don't know, but you young folks are here tonight under the sound preaching of the Word of God and not out in the world today. Praise the Lord. Hey, don't let the grace that God's put on you, the protection He's put on you, and if you're saved, the eternity He's given you and the grace of God, don't let it be in vain. Do something and serve God. Do something far more important than making money. Serve God. It might not be popular today, but I guarantee it's the winning side of the coin. Amen. Serve God. That's, that's all free. That's, that's free plus an ice cream sandwich. That's all free. Are you in Ephesians chapter 6? Let's pray right quick. Lord, help me tonight just portray a couple of thoughts you give me. Help me to be bold, Lord, in my stand. Lord, empty me of me, Lord, but fill me of you. Help somebody tonight, Lord, to stand and be bold in your power and serve you, Lord, not us. Help us tonight, Father. Help us to think about being a bold witness and testimony for thee, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says, anybody know what Ephesians chapter 6 is basically about? Basically summing up, it's telling us about the armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 11, the Bible says, put on, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Does anybody write in their Bibles? Is that against the rules here? I don't want to get in trouble. Okay, can we write in our Bible? You can also yell amen, even if that's against the rules. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You can still shout if you want to. We're, we're still Baptist, amen? Hey, put on. If you write in your Bibles, if you write in your Bibles, if you highlight, underline, what I, what I write right there next to verse number 11? Dolly. Daily. Daily. Daily, good. One person can read my chicken scratch. One said Dolly. <laughs> yeah, Dolly. Hey, daily. Put on the whole armor of God daily. 
It does no good for a team to have the very best helmets and very best cleats and very best game plan and very best uh, 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 strategy and very best practice procedures and the very best health and the very best athletes to just stare at all that equipment and all that all that help they have. These athletes have to put on daily their health routine. They have to put on the uniform that their, their coach has given them. They've got to put on the means to success to beat the enemy. Do they not? Do you think whoever your best favorite team is in college or sports today steps on the football field next Saturday or Sunday? If they stepped out there without helmets and without football cleats uh, and without proper shoulder pads and gear, do you think they would be successful or unsuccessful? That's pretty simple. Why in the stinking world do we want to get up every day and not put on the whole armor of God like, the God, like Paul tells us to and think we're going to be successful? You're like, well, I'm not really in a battle like they are. You're not. You're in a battle much fiercer than they are. For the Bible tells me the whole armor of God were to put on that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles can be translated as strategy. We're to put on the whole armor of God, young people, daily because the devil has a strategy. And need I say, it seems to be pretty productive lately. Seems to be pretty productive. And that old-fashioned devil, he's, he's called in 2 Corinthians uh, the prince of this world. He's in, in Revelations, he's, he's the old deceiver. He's one that deceiveth the whole world. You're to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand boldly against the strategies of the very one that deceives this world. But we tend to think Sunday morning, Sunday night, three to thrive is enough. No, we've got to put it on daily. I know that might, this might surprise you, but that's not what I'm preaching on. Look, uh, we're to stand therefore in verse number 14. Now, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, the faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always. And Paul says, this is why. This is where I want to get to it. I'm only going to be able to spend about 10 minutes here. Look. Verse number 20, why did Paul say you must put on the whole armor of God daily? Uh, you must take you, he says in verse number 34, take the whole armor of God. And he lists these things. Why must you? The Bible says in verse 20, he says, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, and there I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I wrote in my Bible that we would be bold ambassadors for Christ that you would be bold. You see, let's backwards plan like we do in the army. You can't be a bold person for Christ and you can't be an ambassador if you're not suited up in the armor of God. Amen? Can you hear me? Amen? You've got to suit up daily in the armor of God to be a bold ambassador for Christ. It's what Paul said. I'm not adding to it or taking away from it. My King James Bible looks just like yours. And then there's another piece of armor that you might not see in your Bibles. It's in the book of Isaiah, and it's in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 17. The Bible tells us this. If you have there, that's way back in the Old Testament. A little more than midway through your Bible. Look at Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and garments of vengeance for clothing. And, hey, this isn't in, this isn't in Ephesians chapter 6, but I like it. And clad with zeal as a cloak. Clad with zeal as a cloak. Y'all know what zeal is? That means you're believing what you're selling, amen? <laughs> you're believing what you're saying. Your walk matches your talk. Amen. Suit up in the whole armor of God and walk around defeated today. 
No, folks, put a cloak of zeal about you. I can really hey, do a study on the cloak and where the cloak was so important to a Roman's armor. Uh, and it, it covered up that belt of truth. It covered up that side piece of that sword or dagger. Uh, it, it, it covered up. He, would, he could even put his shield in his cloak. He could stay warm on a cold night in his cloak. It provided shelter. It provided protection. Zeal. Zeal is the key to the Christian armor, folks. Once we get the Christian armor on, I'm not saying that the being prepared with the gospel of Christ, of course, is very important. Um, having our shield of faith and our helmet to be saved, our helmet of salvation is important. But a cloak of zeal is so important. It's in, is it important for us to go to heaven? No. It's important for us to be a bold ambassador for Christ, though. Y'all with me still? Again, that's not what I'm preaching on. I just, I just want to, uh, um, uh, uh, by way of introduction and three quick points, I want to tell you that it's our job to be a bold ambassador to Christ and for Christ, I'm sorry. In the book of Romans, the Bible tells us this. You don't have to turn there. We'll be in and out of there for a second. If I go five or ten minutes max over, the, over uh, seven o'clock, we're going to be okay, Pastor. Thank you very much. Uh, tell me no, and I mean it if I can't. Uh, the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Has anybody never heard that verse of Scripture before? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved calling on him, saying, Lord, I agree. I understand I'm a sinner. I understand that the only way to heaven is through you, that, that uh, you're the one mediator between man and God. It's the man, Jesus Christ, that you're the way, the truth, the life, that no man cometh to the Father but by you, Jesus Christ. I understand that. You died for my sins on the cross of Calvary. There was sin debt to pay, and you paid it, and I must apply that to my debt call upon the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not a one, two, three, repeat after me and you'll be saved. I, I'm not that guy. I, I, we're not going to lead 35 people to Christ every time I preach because you all raised your hand and repeated a prayer. But hey, I think we make it awful complicated these days. Let's believe in what Jesus Christ did. Amen? Let's believe what we're selling. Let's believe what we're telling. Let's boldly be an ambassador for Christ. And let's tell somebody, hey, you're a sinner like I was a sinner. Am a sinner still. I have my sins forgiven. I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You can too. Let me show you how. Bold ambassador style. Be bold about it. Enthusiastic about it. And sell it to them. And the Bible says that whosoever shall, anybody you give that pitch to, so to speak, anybody you preach to, if they were to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and call upon Him to save Him, they shall be saved. Isn't that the goal? It's not to build a bigger baseball field out back. It's to win lost souls to Christ. It's to win people to Christ. It's not to build orphanages overseas. It's to win people to Christ. Listen, that's the goal. And then Paul. I, Paul not only wrote and penned my life first, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. I told you about it, but by the grace of God. But Paul also is my hero in the Bible. I don't say character. These are real people in the Bible. These are real people. They're not characters. There's characters in Louis L'Amour books. <laughs> There's heroes in our Bible. And Paul, definitely a hero from his conversion on, says, How then, in, verses, in verse number 14 of Romans chapter 10, How then shall they call upon him, call on him whom they have not believed? How and how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without you, folks? How shall they hear if you don't take the gospel to them? How shall they hear? I see a lot of empty seats in here tonight. By, by show of hands, don't raise your hand. But think of this. Who did you invite to church tonight?
And when you got to church, you stood out there in the foyer waiting on them to come because you earnestly wanted them to come so that they could hear the gospel preached tonight. If I said by show of hands, raise your hand if you came in five minutes late because you were waiting on your friend or that stranger or that relative or that co-worker to come into church tonight because you invited them this week and you've been praying for them, and you've been working on them, and you waiting on that person to come in, by show of hands, if I were to ask you, how many of you would raise your hand? Because, boy, you've been waiting on that person to come. Oh, they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear somebody preach to them. If you couldn't raise your hand, why? I heard, I heard this morning, what's a soul really worth these days? Heard a preacher today from Pennsylvania. His name is Pastor Moore, Gary Moore. Gary Moore from Pennsylvania preached up in Belton, Texas, in Temple, Texas today. And he preached about what's it worth to you. We've devalued the worth of a soul these days. Amen. Amen. We've devalued the worth of a soul. He gave an illustration about a funeral home that does a great job in reconstructing those people that lay in the casket. And when people come by to see their loved one for the last time, the person looks so good. They look like they're almost just asleep. And they really do a good job. And he said, really, he wishes that they would do it not so good. Because we seem to think that's them. That's not them. Their soul is gone and their soul's in an eternity today. You see, we don't have a... It's not a body that contains a soul. It's a soul that's just in a body for this short period of time on life. Souls are real, and everybody you come in contact with has one. And they're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. Amen? All that was introduction, and I planned on preaching something tonight. Uh, hey, I'll tell you what I was going to preach. He said 10 after was okay. Ice cream sandwich is still on him. I'll tell you about a couple of preachers in the Bible. Y'all can research the story because it matters what these preachers did and it matters what I'm able to do over in South Korea. And you know what? It matters what you're willing to do with the gospel. Do y'all remember when y'all got saved? You remember the day you got saved? Do you remember who led you to the Lord? You remember where you were? I do too. I was the youth pastor. I was, yeah, yeah, talk about getting the cart in front of the horse. I was the youth pastor and the song leader at my sending church today, Maranatha Baptist Church in Oak Grove, Kentucky. I was the youth pastor, sir, and I was the song leader. I had led some of those youth to the Lord. And I came forward and I got saved that one night. I realized that 2 Corinthians 5.17 was still in my Bible, just like it was in my preachers. And all things weren't passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There wasn't much new in my life. I was lost. Church member, listen, church membership don't get you to heaven, amen? Baptism or mama's name or dressing up or cleaning your life up doesn't get you to heaven. Asking Jesus Christ to save you gets you to heaven, amen? amen. Repenting. But placing your faith and trust in all that Jesus Christ did. So you remember a day that you did that? Brother Tim, you remember when you got saved? Real quickly, where were you? In my truck in a parking lot. He was in his truck in a parking lot because it took place at a specific place. On a specific day, you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. Young man, you remember when you got saved? Who led you to the Lord? Your dad, praise the Lord for faithful men and women that will preach to their kids and give them the gospel because they care enough. Right? Devonna, you remember when you got saved? Who led you to the Lord? Pam Workman. Pam Workman, amen. Great missionary in Africa today. You remember you were at Central Baptist Church outside a classroom back in the halls, weren't you? You know why my wife remembers that? Because it happened one day. Y'all remember when Philip... Ooh, in Acts chapter 8 was preaching up a revival. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse number 5, and Acts chapter 8, verse number 12, that he was preaching Jesus. 
He was preaching. He wasn't trying to put together a new program. He wasn't having a pizza party or a Super Bowl uh, party on the stage at church. Uh, he wasn't having a softball tournament to bring him. He was preaching Jesus, Philip was. And for some reason, for some reason, an angel of the Lord showed up in Acts chapter 9. Oh, I've got to get to this point and go. Acts chapter 9, verse number 26. He said, Arise and go toward the south unto a place that goeth down to Jerusalem unto Gaza. And he rose and went. Philip just got up and went in the middle of a revival. Okay, God, I'll go. Praise the Lord for people that will just get up and go. Praise the Lord for Brother Ricky Clark and those folks at that church that kept giving me the gospel. Found it important. Philip found it important. And you know that Philip runs into the Ethiopian eunuch. Y'all know that story? And the Ethiopian eunuch's riding the chariot across. And what's the Ethiopian eunuch doing? Who remembers? Okay, it's not a, it's not a tricky quiz. Uh, he was reading the Word of God out of the book of Isaiah. He was reading about a lamb that was led, an innocent lamb led to slaughter. And Philip ran up to him and said, what are you reading? He said, well, I'm reading out of the book of Isaiah. And he reads to him. Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no. How can I let some man teach me? How are they going to hear? How are they going to believe? And how are they going to call on somebody they've never heard? The Bible says in Acts chapter uh, 9, verse number 35, Philip opened his mouth and began preaching at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus! <laughs> How's this Ethiopian eunuch going to call upon the name of Jesus had he never heard the name of Jesus? Amen? And Philip, that faithful preacher, took the name of Jesus to that Ethiopian eunuch. Didn't care what color his skin was, amen? Didn't care what nationality or ethnic background he came from or what social status he was. Philip went because God says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Philip went, didn't he? The very next chapter, Saul's converted on the road to Damascus. Praise the Lord. He says, oh, Jesus. He says, I'll do anything. And Jesus says, okay, get up. He was blinded. And, uh, in the very next page on my Bible, Acts chapter 9, verse number 26, Paul was going forward preaching. Paul was instantly converted, changed, and began telling folks the truth about Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. I could go on to this story. Listen, let me, let me wrap this up. I've got to find a place to cut it off. Look, Brother Tim, you remember when you were saved? In your pickup truck in a parking lot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God made a difference in your life, hadn't he? Made a difference in my life too. Devon, made a difference in our marriage, didn't he? Made a difference in my life, my career. God could never use me today had he not made a difference in my life back in 2003. I remember the day, the person, I remember the place. You remember it too. Brother Dusty, you remember it too, don't you? I'm not putting words in your mouth. You remember the very day, don't you? Who led you to the Lord, Pastor? My pastor at the time. Amen, your pastor, amen. <coughs> amen. Let me just wrap this up now, honestly. Pastors say that ten times in a sermon, don't they? But it's, it, it's good right here. This is good. You know, there's three things present in all these conversions we're talking about, when you got saved, when your dad led you to the Lord, when you were in your pickup truck and got saved, when she was in that classroom and got saved, when I was at the altar at Maranatha Baptist Church, although I was already a church member carrying a King James Bible, uh, uh, leading the singing that night, and leading the youth. Hey, you know, the, when every one of you got saved, if you remember the very day it happened, there was three things present. The same three things were present when Philip led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord, when, G when Jesus Christ spoke to Saul and said, get up, serve me, Saul. When, when, when Peter went to Cornelius' house and every Everybody got saved that day. There was three things present, every single one of them. Number one, the Word of God was present in every single one of those situations. Was the Word of God present in the cab of your pickup truck, sir? I bet it was. Probably wasn't the first time you ever heard the Word of God either. It had been present, knocking at your heart's door. I guarantee the Word of God was your present if your dad, the preacher, led you to the Lord. Amen? Word of God present in your life? Probably present that very day, wasn't it? The Word of God is powerful, sharp, and ever-present in all these conversions. It was being preached faithfully. One day, in two, one day in 1998, five years before I got saved, a faithful man at Maranatha Baptist Church was out with the teen group, and he handed my wife a track, and he said, Are you going to church anywhere? And my wife said, No, we're brand new at Fort Campbell. He said, Well, would you come visit our church? Oh. 
Where would I be if we didn't get invited to church that day? Where would I be and whose lives would have been affected all throughout eternity? Because that man, Reggie Bailey, invited me to church that day. Come on, folks, you with me? The Word of God was present. Philip used the Word of God and preached it. Cornelius also knew the Word of God. Cornelius, when he, before he spoke to Peter, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, the second and third verses, that he was a devout man that gave much and prayed much. He knew the, he knew the Scriptures. So did Saul. Number two, what was present was the Holy Spirit. Way before I got saved, the Holy Spirit was working on me, was directing me. The Holy Spirit led Brother Reggie Bailey to my wife at a Walmart parking lot to hand out tracts. My wife was burdened to go to that church and went. I got out of the field with the 101st Airborne Division, came home. My wife said, we got to go to that church. We went the first time I really, really, really heard it hit me. The Word of God was faithful to be preached. And the Holy Spirit was working all that time. The Holy Spirit led Philip down there to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Holy Spirit led Peter and Cornelius to link up together. The Holy Spirit led somebody to pass out a track one day. The Holy Spirit urged me one day, although I was a youth pastor and a song leader, to get up and preach, the, to get up and come to the altar and get saved. There's so much more to this. We can go so deep. Let me tell you thirdly. <clears throat> the Word of God was present. The Holy Spirit was present. And thirdly, there was a messenger present in every one of those instances. There was a messenger present. Ma'am, do you remember who led you to the Lord? Was there a messenger involved? Was there a person involved? There was, wasn't there? God, God called that person to surrender his life to preach the gospel and to see folks get saved and gave them a heart to, to, to care about. Probably knew you weren't saved and was telling you God loved you. Told you what Jesus Christ did for you. I can probably guarantee that preacher was quite a messenger, wasn't he? You got a messenger in your story where you got saved one day? There's a messenger in all these stories. Philip was a great messenger. Paul became a great messenger, did he not? Peter was a great messenger. Ricky Clark was a messenger. Reggie Bailey passing out those tracts was a messenger. Your dad was, although a pastor of a church baby or a preacher or a good Christian man when you were like, was a messenger. There was a messenger present in all those instances, Brother Dusty. A preacher. How will they hear? How are they going to call on somebody they don't believe? How are they going to believe on somebody they had never heard of? And how are they ever going to hear without a messenger, people? In South Korea, there's probably 10 to 12,000 people right outside the gate of Calvary Baptist Church in Daegu, where I'm going. There's about 5,000 over here and about six or 8,000 over here, give or take a few numbers, some family members. And the Word of God is present there. It's, it's 2018. The Word of God is present anywhere they want to go. Amen? The Holy Spirit is just as powerful today as it was when Paul penned these words. Amen? Just as powerful. What we're lacking is not the Word of God. What we're lacking is not the Holy Spirit. What we're lacking is faithful messengers. I'm going to be a messenger to go to South Korea to tell the soldiers about Jesus Christ. And my key line, I, everybody's got to have a key line, is can I give you one of these? Somebody gave us one one day and it changed my life. I guarantee it can do something for your life. Would you be a messenger today? We're not short anywhere else in the ministry. We're short messengers. Would you pray about helping us get over there, please? We need to get there. We're going to be a faithful messenger, I guarantee it.